Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening online seminar. Tonight, we are joined by Richard Silver, consultant solicitor at Fletcher Day, and we are going to be discussing what is concurrent delay. As always, Richard is happy to answer any questions for you. You can use the chat facility or the Q&A facility in the bottom toolbar. Alternatively, if there is something you'd like to ask him, but you don't wish to do so in an open forum, you can see his email address there on the screen, richard.silver at fletcherday.co.uk. He will be happy to answer any direct queries for you. Uh, without any further ado, Richard, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Julie. Good evening, all. Um, this evening, I'm doing a course on um, concurrent delay. Um, as you'll see on the current slide, my background is in construction. Um, I uh, was fortunate enough to be made both Chief Surveyor and Construction Director of construction companies, but prior to that date, um, I was a contracts manager and a, a senior surveyor on construction sites. Um, and as I've said on many occasions, unfortunately, not one of my projects that I was involved in ever finished on time. Uh, every job I was ever involved in um, was late. Um, but quite obviously, um, it wasn't my fault, it was everybody else's fault. Um, and in seeking to avoid um, liquidated damages and equally in seeking to recover loss and expense, we always claimed extensions of time. Um, but what was quite often thrown back at our faces was the fact that there were delays that we were responsible for and we then got into argument as to whether we were or were not entitled to extensions of time. And indeed, at the moment, um, I have a number of matters that I'm dealing with either as an adjudicator or as acting as a party representative in adjudication concerning extensions of time and which involve assessments as to which is the critical delay or is there current current delay. And that's particularly the case because of COVID. Uh, jobs were on delay because of COVID. The question is, is, is a contractor entitled to extension of time or not? Um, the problem of concurrent delay generally arises is because there are two delaying events. One is the responsibility of the employer, the other, the contractor. The employer says, well, sorry, it's your delay that is the critical delay. And the contractor says, oh, no, it's not. It's your delay that's the critical delay. And they get into arguments. And that's where the issue of concurrent delay arises. But it can arise in other circumstances. Let's just say that we have delay because of exceptionally adverse weather conditions and also a delay for which the employer is responsible. The employer is going to, under a JCT form of contract, award the extension of time for the weather, knowing that he won't have to pay loss and expense. The contractor, nevertheless, is going to want the extension of time for, let's say, late information, knowing that that is as well a, a relevant matter, thereby obtaining loss and expense. So the whole issue is about one or two or more delays and which one is the critical delay. Um, the issue of what is a concurrent delay has been identified in this case, I'm going to read it, a period of project overrun, which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay, which are of approximately equal causative potency. Interesting words at the end of that. What does it actually mean? We are talking about causation. In other words, the delay called the period of prolongation, but we're talking about which one is the most potent. Um, and that's where, um, in my view, a lot of problems arise. Um, now, the Society of Construction Law provides a protocol. And within it, that, they have identified a mistaken view of mixing up concurrent delay and concurrent effects. And that, to me, is a key point. So let's deal with concurrent delay. Let's just say that today we have exceptionally adverse weather conditions which stops the works progressing. Let's just say that it's in London and for whatever reason, there is a hurricane. You don't often get hurricanes in London. So clearly it's exceptionally adverse weather conditions. It's happened today. 
But equally today, we were meant to be doing piling, but the design, which was down to the employer, has not been provided to us. So today, we equally cannot do that work. But equally today, we have not um, carried out certain works to allow access for the piling contractor or the piling contractor themselves have gone to receivership. So for our own fault, there's another reason why those works cannot go ahead. And all of these occurred today. That is concurrent delay because the effects or the, the actually event always happened in the same time. Now, to really emphasize this point, in the case of Saga Cruises versus, and I've got to pronounce this, Fincantieri, um, it was all to do with the construction of a cruise line and some refurbishment works being done to it. And on the 2nd of March, there were major delays for which the contractor was responsible and which were likely to cause a delay of, let's just say, three months. On the 3rd, just the next day, there was a major problem which also caused a delay, but which the employer was responsible for. The contractor said, well, look, there's concurrent delays. Yes, there was a delay caused by us yesterday, but there is an equally long delay caused by you, the employer, today. There's a day apart, they are concurrent delays, and we are entitled to an extension of time. The court considered that, and they said they were not concurrent delays. They were, in effect, concurrent effects. The two delays were not concurrent because one happened before the other. And what this case indicated, when looking at causative potency, one thing you've got to consider is when the delays occurred, when they actually impact the program. So in other words, according to this decision, this judgment, there are only concurrent delays when they impact the program on the same day. And I ask you, how often does that actually happen? Very, very rarely. And therefore, we need to consider and apply that logic. And I'm going to deal with another case, which is Balfour BT versus Chesterman. Um, and what happened in Balfour BT versus Chesterman was that the contractor, let's say, um, had delayed the job. Um, practical completion should have been achieved. Completion date had elapsed, yet the works were incomplete. And let's just say for argument, a week had elapsed. So the contractor is now responsible for a critical delay of a week, um, not entitled to an extension of time. But on this week, on the seventh day, luckily for him, the employer issues an instruction to paint the door green. And they've got no green paint on site, so they've got to go and buy some green paint and they will not be able to do it till tomorrow. Contract says, fantastic. Now there is two concurrent delays. What's more, quite clearly, I could not complete the works until you issued this instruction. We carried out the works. So I now want eight days extension of time. What the court said was in the first end of, uh, instance is that they were not concurrent delays because quite clearly the delays caused by the contractor had occurred first. What then one needs to consider is, is what is the additional delay caused by the instruction to paint the door green? And the answer is just one day. So therefore the contractor is entitled to an extension of one day and means that he actually had to complete before the instruction for the green door was even issued. But that is the current case law. So two things we need to identify. When dealing with concurrent delay, we need to establish whether they are of the same importance, the same potency, or not. And one of the key factors that will be taken into account is when the events occurred and impacted the programme. Now, if, and I do emphasize and underline the word if, if there are two concurrent causes of delay, then the current case, Henry Boot versus Mal Mason, says that the contractor is entitled to an extension of time, even though he may have caused a delay of the same period himself. So just to make this really clear, if there are two concurrent delays, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time. 
Henry Boot versus Mal Mason did not say, however, whether or, or reach any judgment on whether the contractor was entitled to their full loss and expense. But what is clear is they're entitled to their extension of time and would have no liability for liquidated damages. However, Henry Boot is an English case. And in Scotland, the approach was very different. In Scotland, they can apportion delay. In other words, when there's two concurrent delays, they may decide that the contractor gets 50% and the employer gets 50% or any other percentage. They can apportion. But in England, Henry Boot versus Mount Mason says it's win all take all. In other words, if there's two concurrent delays, the contractor gets some a full extension of time. Now, following the Mount Mason case, there was some uncertainty whether or not we were following the Scottish approach of apportionment or whether the contractor was entitled to a full extension of time. And in the case of Walter Lilly versus McKay, it was confirmed that the contractor would be entitled to a full extension of time where there are concurrent delays. So just to go over this again, in England, the current case law is where there are two concurrent delays the contractor is entitled to a full extension of time. In Scotland, however, there is the possibility of apportionment and the contractor may not be entitled to a full entitlement to extension of time. Now, mindful of that position, the parties, or more often the employer, addresses in the contract what happens in the event of concurrent delay. So you may put in your contract, by way of example, if there are two concurrent delays, one for which the contractor is responsible and one for which the employer is responsible, and they are both concurrent, the contractor can have no entitlement to extension of time. And I've seen that clause, and dare I say, I've drafted that clause. And in North Midland versus Side and Homes, the court considered the enforceability of that clause, and they said there was no problems with that. In such situation, despite the contractor having been delayed by a concurrent delay, they were entitled to no entitlement to extension of time. Okay, so what we've identified is, is in the UK, in the UK, in England, not Scotland, in England, if there are two concurrent delays, um, the contractor will be entitled to a full extension of time. The question is then, how do you prove that delay? Um, and the black art of programming and planning is one that comes up with various methodologies on proving delay. But the area I wanna start with is what does the contract say? And let's just deal with two contracts. JCT says that the contractor shall give a notice as soon as it becomes reasonably apparent of any delay or potential delay, giving full particulars and an estimate of delay. It is all prospective. It is not retrospective. It is all looking to the future. And the architect, the CA, the project manager, depending upon the particular contract, then looks and assesses what the delay is and awards an extension of time and has to do so within a period of 12 weeks from having the notice and sufficient particulars. Now that may well be the case that he's going to award an extension of time before the completion date under the contract has even been met. So it is all theoretical because it may be the case that the contract is either delayed by a lot longer period or a lot less. Now let's turn to the NEC. The NEC works even more different. It says that the contractor's entitlement to extension of time is to be based upon the last accepted program and the current accepted program. It is completely theoretical. I'll give you an example. The contractor issues a program for acceptance of 50 weeks, notwithstanding that the contract provides for a period of 60 weeks. In other words, he's gonna finish 10 weeks early. What then happens is the employer issues some additional instructions and he therefore issues a revised program as part of his quotation and shows on his revised program a period of 60 weeks, which is accepted. We now have to assess his extension of time. It's the difference between the last accepted program, 50 weeks, and the current accepted program of 60 weeks. The difference is 10 weeks and the contractor is therefore entitled to a 10 week extension of time 
despite the fact he wasn't even delayed beyond the original completion date stipulated in the contract. What we've identified here is that in both these contracts, the intention is that it should be based upon um, prospective delay analysis, what is um, believed to be the effect, not what is actually the effect. But the courts have not necessarily followed that line. The first thing they've done is, is if you're gonna end up in litigation, it's gonna take years, which means by the time your, your judgment is passed down, everything is gonna be in the past. And what they've always looked at in assessing the delay is retrospective delay analysis, not prospective. They've actually looked at what actually happened. And what they've identified is, is that the analysis is only as good as the data that is provided, the records that are produced. And it's my experience, unfortunately, that too often the records that are kept are not good. This is another important case that really re-emphasizes this case. Um, Northern Ireland Housing Executive versus Healthy Buildings. Um, there were a number of disputes, and dare I say, I was involved in one of the first. Um, I was the adjudicator in a matter, it was under the NEC, and the question was, was the uh, healthy buildings entitled to an extension of time where they had not issued a compensation event notice? And what I decided was that they were because the um, compensation event was a change to the works information. And under the NEC, there is an obligation on both the project manager and the contractor to issue a compensation event notice. And the contract provides that where they don't give such a notice, they do not lose their, un their entitlement, unlike the other compensation events. But this dispute went on and on and on. And ultimately, um, it went to court with regards to what was their entitlement. Um, and what the judge said, it's there in bold, why should I shut my eyes and grope in the dark when the material is available to show what work they actually did and how much it cost to them? It was all to do with re retrospective analysis. What the court said was, we have the actual evidence and we should therefore consider it. It shouldn't be based upon what was forecast at the time, but should be based upon what actually occurred. A surprising fact when one thinks what the NEC or how the NEC has been drafted. Now, I said at the start that I, my background is in construction and in many, many of the jobs I was involved in finished late. My experience, more often than not, jobs finish late. Now, what should happen is the contractor should, as soon as it becomes reasonably apparent, issue a delay notice. If it's, the NE, if it's the JCT, what should happen is they issue the notice as soon as really apparent, they should give the circumstances and particulars and an estimate of the delay. The architect or CA then considers it and within 12 weeks grants an extension of time. How often does that happen? In my experience, very rarely. If one looks at the NEC, what should happen is that the contractor uh, gets an instruction, which is a change to the works information, he issues a compensation event notice, an early warning notice. Um, they call um, an early warning meeting. The PM then says, I accept this is a compensation event notice and it requests that the contractor submits a quotation. The contractor submits a quotation with their program and then the project manager there comes back and accepts it. I don't find that happens either. Uh, more often than not, there is no agreement. They don't agree their compensation events, let alone what the value is. And what I'm identifying is whilst these contracts provide what should happen, more often than not, in my experience, it doesn't. So what do you have to do? Well, it depends upon whether you're buying or selling, whether you're the contractor or the employer. The point is, is and I stressed a moment ago, the importance is, who's got the best records. And therefore the importance is for both parties to keep adequate records. Now, 
One way of proving delay, we've got it here, is the impacted as planned analysis. It's a really simple and inexpensive way. You get your original base program or under the NEC, your accepted program, and you put in what is your expected delay and show what the knock-on effect is. It's really simple. Um, that's in theory what the NEC requires. Um, but it is extremely simple. Um, and quite often the courts has failed because they are unhappy with it. Now, what I would say is, is there is no problem in using that methodology, but do recognize that it is part of a negotiation. If you, however, find that the other party does not agree to it, then you're likely to have to do further work. But I do think that the approach adopted with the NEC is an extremely good one. And I would suggest that parties take that approach, whether it be under the NEC or JCT. And equally, if your project managers, your CAs, your architects, then I think you should also be taking that approach in trying to defend claims. And in supporting and making it far stronger, when producing the percentages complete, back it up with photographs, showing that on the date where you're saying you were 50% complete, here's a photograph showing 50% complete. But as I say, this method is a very simplistic one and the courts haven't liked it. Um, as I've said, the idea that the architect PM issues an award when you request it based upon um, the analysis is rare. You need to recognize that particularly on jobs where they are problematic, there is gonna be an argument. Um, in my experience, um, things are getting more difficult. With the delay by, caused by COVID, that's causing problems. There are going to be further problems, particularly with the supply of labour and materials and plant, and things are getting far more difficult. Um, I've got, as I've mentioned before, a few disputes running at the moment concerning delay analysis. And um, the reality is, is were it not for the great records kept by my clients, it would be very difficult to substantiate extensions of time. It's only with these records am I able to prove it. But what has immediately happened, as soon as I have sought to particularise the delay, the arguments come up of concurrent delay. Without fail, the other side raises the points, but you didn't do this and you hadn't done that and you hadn't placed the order with this. And there are other areas that you are responsible. They are concurrent delays, or at the very least, they are the critical delays and you're not entitled to anything. I have one particular one, as I mentioned before, which is that there is a delay. My client says that they're entitled to an extension of time because of late information. And the argument that has come back is, no, there is a claim for false majeure because of COVID and the shutting of the site. So therefore, whilst you are entitled to an extension time, you're not entitled to any loss of expense because as far as we are concerned, there is a concurrent delay. So going back over things, the first thing to recognize is the difference between a concurrent delay and a concurrent effect. A concurrent delay is where in theory, the delays all occur on the same day and there are effects also run concurrently, albeit that one will finish earlier than the other. By contrast, a concurrent effect where there is no concurrent delay is where there is an event that caused a delay today, and then there is another event that arises in a week's time, and their effects are running concurrently, but they are not concurrent delays. Current case in English law is that if you have a concurrent delay, you're entitled to an extension of time, but there is no binding precedent as to whether you're entitled to your loss and expense. In Scotland, where there are two concurrent delays, the contractor is, may have his entitlement to extension of time apportioned. In other words, they may not get all of it. Where they are not concurrent delay, following the case of Saga, it is viewed that whatever delay impacted the programme first is seen as the critical delay. When seeking to establish, therefore, whether delays are critical or concurrent, the importance is the records you are keeping. The better your records, the more able you will be able to prove one way or the other. 
So far as establishing delay, there is no problem in using whichever means that you think is suitable. But be mindful, should the matter proceed to litigation and potentially adjudication, the courts have emphasized the importance to rely on ret retrospective delay analysis. In other words, what actually happened, not what we think might have happened, but in fact didn't. It is a difference between what uh, people who are experts in program call static analysis and dynamic analysis. Dynamic is where it is not theoretical and the courts hate theoretical delay analysis. Julie, any questions? Sorry, thank you, Richard. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Uh, the Q&A or the chat uh, facility in the bottom toolbar there. Uh, currently, we don't have any, so it looks like you've explained everything perfectly. Thank you very much indeed. I think I have uh, two um, chats. What's that, Julie? Does it say? Ah. No, no, it was just at the front, the slides weren't moving, but oh, that, okay. that, that was cleared up, so that's fine. Okay. Okay, we are back tomorrow at 6 p.m. with Mohammed Haq, who is looking, or is the latest in his uh, changes in construction contracts, the valuation and other implications. Um, if you'd like to log on for that, please let me have an email uh, with the details on seminars at fletcherday.co.uk. Um, and as we said previously, Richard is always happy to answer any queries that you have via email, richard.silver at fletcherday.co.uk. Uh, it only remains for me to thank everyone for turning up this evening. Richard, thank you for your time as always. You. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you.